Ahead of the Money Week Summit on the 29th of September, we wanted to bring you a series of interviews with some of our favourite fund managers, both those who will be attending the summit and those who aren't. In this interview, I sat down with Marcus Fair Mudge, fund manager at Columbia Threadneedle and the manager of the TR Property Investment Trust, to discuss his views on the current state of the property market and opportunities for investors in the sector. I hope you enjoy the interview, and if you've not already, you can buy your tickets for the Money Week Summit at www.moneyweeksummit.com. So thank you for joining us, Marcus. Thank you very much. So anyone who has exposure to REITs in the property sector, anyone who's had exposure over the past 18 months will know how, how much of a difficult time it's been for investors. Uh, I think we both own TR Property, so we are both feeling the pain. Absolutely. At, in our own portfolios. So what are your current views on how the market's reacting and has it overreacted? Is there more pain to come? Well, Rupert, that's a fantastic question to start with because essentially um, the market is complicated and it's complicated because it's actually got a lot of sectors who are performing very differently. So to answer the question uh, simply is that some markets are clearly now oversold. Um, everybody has suffered from the rapid change in the cost of money and that's really what's driven the downturn. But what's different um, compared to previous cycles is actually market fundamentals are not bad. Um, we have many sectors where there's still an awful lot of you know, strong demand and we'll talk about those sectors in more detail I'm sure a bit, a bit later. Um, but really importantly the thing that you know, real estate markets are really killed by two sort of separate illnesses. One is when the cost of money shoots up and therefore leverage becomes more expensive. The other is oversupply of the physical real estate um, or where there's a collapse in demand. And we've had very little of that. You know, the over, over, we haven't have really had oversupplied markets, i.e. new construction that's you know, been much greater than demand uh, for many years. And that's quite simply because after the, the, the GFC, the, the, the global financial crisis, banks in particular really stopped lending speculatively. So developers were forced to go and find, um, find capital elsewhere. And this was a real constraining factor. And if you look at the central London office market, um, you know, we're, on, we're in a period of you know, very, very low supply relative to, to history. Now, of course, demand itself is, it has, has pulled back, particularly in offices, and we'll talk about that in more detail, I'm sure. Um, but, but at the same time, in the West End, we have vacancy levels of sub-3%. Uh, obviously, in the, in the city, it's probably 7 or 8, and Docklands, it's, it's 12, 13, 14. Those are mo particular markets where demand has reduced quite significantly. But when we look at, you know, broadly across all our pan-European markets, um, we see, you know, remarkably little oversupply. So at, for the last 18 months, it's really all been about the cost of debt. And we've really focused on working out which of those companies um, have, got, uh, have got debt you know, burdens that they are, no, they are not able to cope with. Um, simply, you have two friends. They both have bought flats recently. One of them, or two years ago, one of them stuck with a floating rate mortgage and the other uh, was smart enough to go and buy a five-year fix. And the one who's bought the five-year fix really doesn't care about what's happening to interest rates. And actually, you know, his, his or her cost of, um, of their mortgage each month has been static. Meanwhile, your friend who's on a floater has had a shocker because their cost of debt has gone up hugely. For us, we're just looking at companies who have that scenario but on a much, much bigger scale. Um, the great news is, and we, you know, to give you one live example, uh, this morning a company called Euro Commercial that owns shopping centres in, in France, um, in Sweden and in Italy, uh, produced its half-year numbers, which saw its top line, rent, its top line earnings, so its, its, its rents received, increase by 8.2%. And that's a combination of natural rental growth plus also indexation. Because what we're probably going to get into a bit later on um, is the fact of the matter is one of the great things about real estate, particularly in Europe, is that rents are index linked to a greater or lesser extent. That's, that's something I'd like to cover in a little bit in a little bit. But first of all, I, TR has beaten its benchmark in 11 of the past 12 years. And you yourself have been around in this industry 
for a long enough. Uh, we're seeing, as you described, interest rates have gone up. It's a different capital cycle, different market cycle. How does this market cycle compare to previous cycles that you've seen or seen companies go through? How are they reacting differently? How should investors react differently to the current, uh, current environment? Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, thank you for um, uh, highlighting our, our relative outperformance because essentially that's what, you know, in, investors, for me to justify what I do, um, uh, investors can quite easily go and buy a, a, an ETF, uh, a tracker uh, of my benchmark. Um, but I'm really pleased to be able to say that, you know, we have beat the, beaten that benchmark consistently over the years. Um, and over the last decade, you, you would have made about 60% more um, uh, being with us rather than with, with a tracker. And, and, but there, and there are a number of reasons about, for that, and, and, and some of them are about the structure of the trust, and we'll get what we're able to invest in, we'll get into that a bit later. But to answer your question, um, the really interesting thing this time around, because obviously, as you say, I've been through many cycles. I started as a surveyor in 1990, and Knight, Frank and Rutley, as it was then, and then got into real estate equities uh, around 1999, 2000, um, and been working on the trust um, since then. Um, and uh, it's really been about the speed of the change in the cost of money, which has been very, very dramatic and caught a lot of companies unaware. However, uh, what we found is a big difference between the UK and Europe. And a lot of UK property companies, um, very encouragingly, and great credit to many of the boards uh, of these companies, they really learnt their lessons of the 2008-09 um, financial crisis because a lot of UK companies uh, basically went into a deeply discounted rights issue uh, phase and that was very, very value destructive. Um, and I think boards have been very determined not to do that. And it's really encouraging when we look across our UK companies you know, we have an, an, an average, even after the correction we've seen in, in valuations, um, which may not be over, but the ones we've had so far, we still have, for the vast majority of our companies, LTVs in the, in the 30s, um, so loan to value, uh, not, not in the 40s. And that's really because in the investor community, we're just not prepared to allow companies. So if they push their gearing up um, uh, in the last few years, then they were, they were punished for being sort of too aggressive. Now, when you look at the private market, and remember that way more real estate is owned privately than publicly, um, you know, every private equity firm out there would give their, you know, give their eye teeth to, uh, to, 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 uh, to have leverage as low as you know, 35%. They're, they're, really, they're really hurting. And in fact, I think this is going to become, and it's going to come to pass quite quickly now, a real opportunity for a lot of our listed companies. They have firepower. Um, they, they, and and they, they have the ability to, um, uh, to, to draw on RCFs, revolving credit facilities, and, and other forms of debt. They have deep relationships with, these, with, with their banks. In Europe, it's a bit more of a mixed bag. So um, our Swedish property companies, for example, who always operated with much higher levels of leverage um, and, and, and also um, focused on short-term debt, and their argument being that you know, they would, they would, as if interest rates go up, it's because economies are warm, their economy is warming up and therefore they will capture that in rental growth and capital growth. Of course, what's happened this time is the economies are not growing, but the price of money has moved dramatically. So we've had, a lot of, we've had to avoid a lot of Swedish property companies. And the, our, our, our jokey strap line is that the nation that brought you the safest car brings you the scariest property company. And, uh, and there are a couple of those as well. An infamous one called SBB. Um, I won't pronounce the very, very long Swedish uh, full name. It has about 30 letters in it. Um, but you know, that, that share price is down 85%. Um, we, we don't own it, obviously. Um, and we haven't owned it. Um, but just to reflect, you know, that's what happens with these if you get into too much, um, too, too much leverage. The other area of, which is quite interesting is that um, when interest rates were basically zero or, 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 or negative during that long phase of quantitative easing by, by central banks, you saw a lot of euro bond issuance. So a lot of companies in Europe taking advantage of, of unsecured debt. Um, and this has been a problem. We've identified this. We could see that pothole you know, in the road down the line. So we were able to avoid some of, some of those companies. But a, a huge amount of this now, Rupert, is in the price. 
I mean, let's take a stock like Vonovia, the largest uh, residential uh, business, uh, listed business in Europe, 375,000 apartments. I mean, this is buy to let on an industrial scale. Um, they have a lot of these, uh, a lot of these bonds. And that share price has gone from 60 euros to 19. Um, and remember that you know this, this this company has virtually no vacancy. There is a rent, there is a shortage of apartments in Germany. Every every lease has a every building has a waiting list, um, and and rents are um, are restricted. They're they're regulated, which so essentially they're they're below um, uh, below open market value. Um, we have another business called Phoenix Bree Deutschland, um, where they are able to get, when tenants leave, they're able to refurbish these flats uh, and sell them to owner occupiers. And the amazing thing about residential markets compared to commercial uh, is that actually a flat, particularly in a regulated market like Germany or Sweden, is worth more empty than let. Mm -hmm. So you've kind of got the best of both worlds. Whereas here, you know, when you're thinking about commercial property, you know, an industrial building or an office building, shopping center clearly if it's empty it's you know it's a worry for the landlord and it's much lower bad news so i think as a lot of this is 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 investors not really focusing on the um on the minutiae and realizing actually there's a lot of embedded value uh, in in many of these businesses there's an interesting segue there so do you think uh, in the uk and especially in europe if you have this situation where you have a lot of uh, say retail businesses collapse go out because there's a bad environment. Almost every single economy in Europe is struggling to have enough houses, struggling to build enough houses. Rents are skyrocketing, especially in places like Ireland, Portugal, Germany. Rents are really going unless they're regulated in Germany. Do you think there's, there's, there's a failsafe there for companies to say, well, if we can't get the uh, tenant for retail, we'll just turn into a flat? Absolutely. There, were, there was going to be, a, uh, I think, a, an increasing uh, I won't say huge because it's going to take time, but there's a, a groundswell um, from, particularly from governments, um, realizing that it's just environmentally unfriendly to leave buildings empty. Um, it's environmentally unfriendly to go and build new build on green field, and actually converting existing properties are, is something we should all be doing. And give the UK government credit; they've been doing that through something called permitted development. Um, where you, you know, if you want, particularly with older office buildings, excuse me, with older office buildings, you know, outside of a core um, uh, you know, area in certain cities, um, you, you have been free to make that conversion. Um, and absolutely, you, you can't do it in central London, you're not allowed to, but, but in, you know, we, in, on, in the investment trust, we have done it. Uh, we sold a building in Vauxhall uh, to uh, a residential developer. Um, to convert it, and we, we you know we made about forty percent on our money in in a couple of years on the back of that because it was worth much more uh, with a with a residential consent than as a as an older office building. Um, so yes, and I think that the the other thing is that there's a real push for to develop communities where I mean one of the whole problems that I'm sure we'll talk about working from home and and commuting is people don't want to commute an hour an hour and a half on public transport often underground or whatever. Um, and we all know the train strikes is getting harder and harder. So if you can kind of create the 15-minute city where you you know you, you live, work, and play in that in that uh, relatively you know um, uh, close proximity, that will require a much more of a mixed-use environment. So to your point, converting commercial redundant commercial uses to residential, and there's money to be made. And you're making it. Yes, we, we we absolutely, and we have a um, you know, we have a big holding in a in a in a, in a business called Picton, very well run uh, company, and it, it is in the process of with one of its large office assets of going through that conversion process, and as a result, that asset that on the face of it to many people looks like a liability, relatively short leases in the offices, they're gonna it'll they'll be able to convert that to residential. So there's an interesting point there. I mean, there are a couple of listed office regional office players in the UK that are really trading at 50, 60% discounts to report in its asset value. So do you think over the next couple of years there will be a serious adjustment there and there's more money to be made from investors and these companies? Yeah, the, 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 I, I'd, I'd really like to say yes. Um, sadly, the answer is no, because we've done a lot of work on this. And uh, 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 the cost of conversion particularly of older buildings, is, uh, is high relative to, compared to new build. It can be up to about three times the cost. 
Um, and we've worked out that where your exit value, um, so your end product as a, as a, as a residential unit, uh, as a flat, um, once you get below about 300, 350 pounds per foot, it, it's unlikely to be economic. Okay. So for, for, the, for the UK, that's sort of up, you know, for the London area, it's sort of up to sort of St Albans and the M25, the sort of, those sort of, you know, Reading, Maidenhead. Around other cities, you know, the nice leafy suburbs of Manchester and Bristol and Birmingham, etc. But if we're talking about, you know, regional towns, um, residential values, I'm afraid, just aren't, uh, okay. aren't enough. So We've got potentially government regulations about environmental statistics that seems to be muddied the water on where the government will land on that at the moment. Yeah. These offices might not meet, this, meet the criteria. They might not be wanted if everyone's working from home. Are there going to be huge big box offices stranded throughout the country that nobody wants? There will certainly be examples of that, I'm afraid. Um, there, there, there will be redundant buildings. Um, essentially, what will happen is that the market will find a clearing price. Mm -hmm. So uh, an asset which five years ago had a capital value per foot of five or six hundred pounds, you may find by the time the, the lease has come to an end, the building is empty, you have to comply with the, the, the energy performance certificate regime. You've got to be a grade B by 2030, which means you can't let the building as a kind of knackered old building for a few pounds a foot. You've got to spend the money. Um, that actually you, the clearing price will be you know, a, a fraction of that value, you know, maybe 100 pounds, I, 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 don't, I don't know. But we're already seeing examples uh, of that. So the market will just find a clearing price and then either the building gets pulled down and something else is replacing it, or there'll be a conversion uh, opportunity. Um, but it will take time for the owner of the asset to realise that um, you know, the game is, is up somewhat. So I'm afraid, yes, there, uh, there will be, uh, particularly in that um, secondary and tertiary uh, area. Now, really interestingly, listed property companies don't really play in that space. And when you look at staying with offices, and we'll move on to other asset classes in a minute, I'm sure, but it, you know, actually there are very few companies that specialize in, uh, in that. And I've mentioned, mentioned one, and there are some, some others that have some, some regional assets. Um, we're, we're a very big owner of a business called uh, Ediston. Um, now, one of the reasons we got into that, and that, that business now is 100% retail warehousing, but they were, five years ago, a very much a diversified play, and they, they had about a third of their portfolio in offices. And they sold all of those offices um, about 18 months ago. Or, uh, and it was on the back of that, that sale that we really became very interested and bought a lot more shares. Um, and they've been in the news uh, uh, recently, um, having, you know, the board have carried out a strategic review um, and have, you know, because they feel they're too small a company, and it's something I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about. And there is a, you know, they've publicly said that they're in discussions with a major U.S. REIT to buy all the portfolio. So my point is that, you know, whilst we have all these issues in office markets, and by the way, if you want um, 5,000 square feet in the West End today, brand new, best-in-class office space, you will pay a record rent. Rents are rising; they're not they're not falling. Meanwhile, we can go to Barnsley or Blackpool or, uh, or Brighton. Um, in a second-hand space, we can, you know, rents are, are probably 25% below where they, where they were at, at, at so the peak. This is an interesting point, and it ties in with the size of the company, the value of the property, and international buyers. If you look at the listed UK routes, such as Great Portland, Derwent, London, Helical, they have positions in London, good markets, but they're trading at 50% discounts to reported now. And so they've got a portfolio worth a couple of billion. That's nothing for a Blackstone or a, a Brookfield or a KKR. I know KKR owns part of Great Portland. Do you think there's going to be more acquisition activity, which these companies may seem big for our, for our standards, but they're actually tiny on the global stage? Yeah, no, uh, the, an the answer is unfortunately yes. Uh, and this comes back to the fact that you know, real estate can be owned privately or publicly. And, and there has been a huge wave. When, when, when money was very cheap, 
a huge wave of private equity capital coming in and buying listed mm-hmm. property companies. And there is a slide on the TR Property um, presentation, which is on our, on our website for anybody who wants to, to, to have a look, which identifies you know, all the companies in the last three years who've been taken private and whether we own the shares or not. And pleased to say, we've, in most cases, we, we, we have. So I'm afraid I do predict that that will occur if equity markets continue to uh, leave these stocks trading so cheaply. Will it happen in the next three to six months? Possibly not. We need to probably reach peak interest rate. We need to, these, these private equity firms need to understand where they're going get to their, get their funding from. But already this year, we've had um, Blackstone buy industrial REIT, where we, uh, we own 12% of that, the company. We've had uh, CTPT merge with, with, um, with London Metric. We've had Civitas, which we didn't own, the social housing REIT, being bought by uh, CK Holdings. And then, of course, the, the, the announcement recently, which the deal hasn't happened, but, uh, but you know, of, of the sale of, uh, of Epic. Now, this is, these, these are not office deals. Um, uh, you know, they're industrial, social housing, retail warehousing. But, you know, the time will come where capital will, will have found a clearing price and will come back in. So, yes, absolutely, I think there is a, a, a very strong possibility, both not only in the UK, but also I- in Europe. And this is a real underpin for owning mm-hmm. listed REITs. You know, you've, you and I, as in holders of TR property and, and anyone else uh, listening who, who also owns REITs, will, will, will absolutely appreciate the pain they've had, the, the minus 35% uh, last year. Now, we have seen some recovery and it is worth noting that between October last year and the end of February, um, which is when broad you know, global markets started to feel about the, the likelihood of peak interest rates, we saw a 30% rally in, in, in REITs. Mm-hmm. Um, now that sell off, that then sold off again on the back of the US regional banking situation, sticky inflation in the UK. But what's very clear when you look at the, uh, the inflation numbers now, the PMI data, um, et cetera, <clears throat> is that you know, we, we've prob- you know, inflation is, is numbers are coming down. They're still elevated, but they're coming down. And I think um, you know, the longer rates rise, the closer we are to peak rate, as it were. And I would say to investors, yeah, and this is very nice of you. I think I said to you, your timing of inviting me on your show is so. Is I think hopefully we'll look we'll look back and think and think, well, wow, that was fantastic timing, um, because really that's what you know the market is overreacting. I believe, um, and as and it's you know the other problem we have is we're about one and a half percent of the all share, so for a lot of generalist investors, they can ignore the little world of real estate, but you know it means we're, we are underowned. And therefore, when, when things turn around and we start to look really quite an interesting space, that's when you get these surges, and that's what we, have, we saw the so end last year. We've been focusing most of this interview on the capital end, of what's the capital mm. values, how is the market treating the capital values. I think Industrials REIT was a great example because this company was trading below now. But I spoke to the management and they said when they're able to push up their rents on their properties, double-digit percentage every year, because no one was building these units anymore, and that was backing up the dividend, generating a healthy return for investors. So do you think, I mean, as a, from a purely income perspective, is this still an attractive sector? And then what do you think, I mean, if you could explain a bit about the European sector, because in the European sector, for most, it's more widespread to have leases linked to inflation. And how is that in the current environment good for investors? Yeah, it's a, it's an absolutely crucial point because, uh, and I'm I'm really glad we've moved on to this because essentially, the total return from real estate over you know multi decades is is the vast majority of that return is actually income because that is a positive figure every year. The capital account, you know, you know ebbs and flows uh, in a cycle as you would expect, but the income is always there. And so, you know, over a multi-decade period, you would say about 85% of your return actually comes from, from, from the income. But we're at the point where we've had a big negative capital return. So we could be in a chart coming around to the point where we're going to have the double whammy. We're going to have the income and the capital return. But coming back to the income, to the point I made right at the beginning, we are seeing very little corporate distress. We are seeing um, businesses quite capable of absorbing the, uh, the increases in rents that they're being asked to pay. And across Europe, I, mean, I, I highlighted um, the numbers from Euro Commercial this morning, now that 8% uh, 
in the half year. That's a lot. Now, it won't be 60. It won't, they're not going to double that for the, for, for the whole year. Um, but, but the, you know, the, they are able to capture inflation. Um, it's not the same everywhere. Uh, so you have to be quite careful. You can't just look at European CPI and say, right, everyone's going to get that. Um, so it, and it does, it, there, is, there is quite a, a broad spectrum. But essentially, all European leases are index-linked to a greater or lesser extent. It's only in the UK that we have this rather quaint upward-only five-yearly rent review. But of course, that's really going by the wayside because leases are, are, are shortening all the time. Um, the consequence of this is we come back to you know, your dream property company um, where the debt, they've got their debt fixed for five years. And I, and I would use a UK example would be Picton Property where they've been very smart and fixed their debt out to 2031. Um, if they can grow the top line, all of that's going to fall straight through to earnings and to dividends to, to you and I. Um, TR Property had a record earnings last year um, uh, uh, to the year to March uh, 23. Our current dividend yield is five and three quarter percent. And you know, we have lifted the dividend every year. We've av averaged over the last 15 years a a around an 8% per annum compound. Now, you know, this is substantial. Um, and the key for markets is to avoid, uh, for us, is to avoid any sub-market where there is overdevelopment or collapse in demand um, and where earnings are not going to be sustained. Um, so you know, offices uh, are clearly an, an, an area of, of concern. But pretty well every other market, um, you know, things are looking, you know, are, re are reasonably set fair. That's interesting. So you're saying basically everything apart from offices has a brighter outlook. Yes. I mean, obviously the one that's been heavily damaged over the last 10 years has been retail. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you know, we, all of us have walked around shopping centres and there's been, you know, boarded up units. It's been a particular problem in the UK because essentially the department store format has failed. So you generally have these shopping centres with big department stores at either end. And, and that, has, you know, they were always used to attract people in. And of course, we're left now with just, just John Lewis and, and their, their woes are, are well known. The continent, which is, of course, where we have, you know, more, more, we have more exposure to the continent than we do to the UK in, in the trust. We're about... 65, uh, uh, 55, 35, and, and some physical property, um, 35 being the UK. Um, our European shopping centres, they're all full. Um, they're not anchored by department stores, they're anchored by hypermarkets. Think about your French camping holiday. You go to the Carrefour or the, or the Casino, and, and, pay, and it, you know, it's, it's RAM, that's because it's August, but there's a bunch of shops outside, and that's, that's essentially surrounding it. But you're, you're going to go there because it's your, it's your food. Um, and also, you know, Italy, uh, the, you know, here in the UK, we, about 30% of all sales are, are online, ex-food and fuel. Uh, Italy, it's, it's, it's around 10. And I went uh, to see three um, shopping centres, that's how boring I am, um, uh, in, in, in May in, in northern Italy. And I just couldn't believe they were all full. They were, I mean, they were, sorry, they were no, the, the centres were full of people, but they were, the shops were, there, were no, there was no vacancy and they actually have a waiting list. So, you know, the woes that we've experienced here, and in the UK we do genuinely have too much retail. Uh, that is, we're seeing that evolve very quickly with change of, uh, change of use, etc. But values have been hit, and more importantly, rents have essentially halved. So you've now got to, because it's all about finding that, that balance. And retailers today, most big retailers, can afford to, to operate uh, from the stores so they're in. You'd say that sector then is pretty much bottomed. Yeah, yeah I mean, w Wilco has gone bust. Wilco has gone bust because it was, did not keep up with the times. And it basically was put out of business by its competitors like, uh, like Poundland, like The Range. And there was an announcement yesterday that Wilco have about 250 stores. Poundland are going to take 100 of those. Mm -hmm. Now, who knows whether the Poundland are going to say to the landlords of those stores, I can pay that rent or I can pay a lower rent. But chances are they've pan picked the ones they want and therefore they're prepared to pay the rent on those. So there is a, you know, one, one tenant going bust doesn't mean there's a, it's a disaster. So do you think that uh, retail could be used as a case study of what might happen to the office market? Is yes. Is that fair to say? I, I think it is. I think, um, but possibly not as extreme. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem for offices is essentially twofold. It's the working from home, mm -hmm. um, 
But the problem for tenants, uh, for companies, your company, my company, is that you know for, we, we are collaborative, human, interactive, social animals. Um, we want there will be days where we all want to be in the office together, and you need to see clients. You, you, you need to see um, our, our, our customers, suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you know, if everybody's working from home, that's not, that's not going to work. So essentially, the whole Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday peak rate issue means that for companies, you've, you've really got to have enough space to be able to accommodate that peak rate. And you just have to accept that possibly at other times, of, uh, in the same way that we are pay, your company and my company are paying for rent on a Saturday and a Sunday, we don't say no, we're, we're not going to have the office space because we're not in it on Saturday and Sunday. So I think that that is probably going to curtail the, how, how much uh, uh, businesses do reduce their, their office space. I think we're changing the type of office space, so much more collaboration, etc., and better quality. You know, if, when a labour market is tight and you have a choice, as a, a, particularly as a, you know, as a, as a, as a new employee, um, you're going to want to work somewhere that's a good environment. Um, and if you can, if the commute, you can stomach the commute if you only have to do it three times, three times a week. The second problem for offices, um, which is a more tricky one, and we've already touched on it, is, is the EPC, is the need to uh, basically upgrade all space. Now, all this means is that there is a, essentially a green building super cycle coming up. We are seeing that already. There's some you know, very high quality deals uh, being done. Um, in the round, I think the, uh, it, the office markets still haven't finished, they, they haven't bottomed yet, and it is going to be very local. But to remind um, viewers that this is a particular issue in London uh, because of the length of the commute and the size of the city. It's a particular issue in the US because, again, long commutes and uh, a, a, a lot of a lot of uh, Americans work in um, out-of-town business park locations. You think about the Dilbert cartoons, you know, with no amenities, you know, no restaurants, no gyms. No, you know, it's a great thing about central London. You've got lots on your doorstep, or central Manchester, or central Birmingham, etc. Um, and and what we are what we're going to find um, uh, is that what we do see is that in Europe, where cities are much smaller, you know, Germany has no one dominant city. Has six big ones, yep. but they're kind of like the size of Birmingham. You know, Frankfurt is smaller than Birmingham. Commutes are much shorter. And I talk to my colleagues in other parts of our business uh, who are based in, in, in Stockholm, in Zurich, in Geneva, Milan, Madrid. They're all back at work at least four days a week. Yep. Not in August, obviously. The, our continental cousins take the whole month off, but uh, it's always... Because right. it's 40 degrees there. Well, yeah, that, that, that's true. And that, that actually is another point. You know, in the US, people you know, in the southern half of the, of the United States, everybody has air conditioning, um, uh, or the vast majority of people. Um, in, in Europe, domestically, you don't. Um, and therefore, you know, it's quite hard to work at home, um, uh, in, you know, particularly, and we all will have found it this summer. Uh, obviously not recently. The weather's been terrible, but... Uh, <laughs> Maybe today. Yeah. And that feeds back into the environmental issue. I mean, the, yeah. the cost of upgrading offices to cope with hotter climates, more volatile climates, and the impact that might have on property prices. That, that is another headwind, to use the deliberate... Uh, Do you think there will be stranded assets, to use that term? Yes. Yeah, in the UK? I yeah, no, I think, I think yes, that the, there will be. And essentially what we have always tried to focus on is the depreciation and the rate of depreciation. At the end of the day, a building is a physical asset. You think about the money you spend on your, on your house, you know, painting the windows or replacing the bathrooms or whatever, whatever you do, or even doing you know, the patio. You know, all of this is improvement. And building, commercial property is the same. It's not a static entity. And you know, it, does, it, does, it does age and depreciate. And essentially what, what the um, you know, you know, global warming uh, as well as the uh, government regulatory requirements, they are accelerating this depreciation. Um, and that is a factor that has to, be, uh, has to be taken into account. So we feel that we are attracted to those, particularly city centre markets, um, where, to be quite blunt, more of the value is in the land. Because mm -hmm. um, the great thing about the terra firma is that doesn't depreciate. You, know, there is, you can't do anything yeah. to, to depreciate that. Um, and that's why, yeah, we, we are uncomfortable with an awful lot of um, out-of-town um, business park-style locations. 
So uh, just to, two quick questions to come up and wrap up. And the first one I think might feed into the second one. If you had to pick one sector in Europe that you think is going to do well over the next 10, 20 years, what would you go for? I'm afraid it, 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 is, it is still going to be light industrial um, and logistics. Okay. Uh, light industrial because we're just everywhere, we haven't built enough of it. Um, the internet has changed how companies deal with each other. Um, traditionally, 20 years ago, you were a small manufacturer, you had to sell your, your wares to a wholesaler who then sold it, uh, sold it on. Now you're doing direct to consumer, you're doing you know, direct to, court, to, to, to other commercial companies. On the, on the, um, on the, indus on the logistics side, I, I think the world, we're in a, we're in a long state, uh, a, a long period now um, uh, of not total deglobalization, but a realization that these very long supply chains don't work, or are they dangerous? And that um, you know the situation between Russia, China, the U.S., Taiwan, Ukraine. You know, I think there are a lot of manufacturers who want to bring um, uh, manufacturing closer to home, shorten supply chains. This means they're going to need to store more kit locally. Um, we, we, we know the government have, have taken huge amounts of space to store um, uh, PPE for a, for a future pandemic. I mean, you know, all of that has to, all that planning has to be done. So the, the rather trite expression, a little more just in case and a little less just in time, uh, will mean that there will be more demand, structural demand for, for space. Right there, on the top topic of industrial space. Yeah. Okay. And then, so fi finally, is it, We've seen real estate investment trusts collapse in value. Do you think that this is a forward-looking, the stock market is generally forward-looking, do you think this is a forward-looking indicator that physical property investors, private physical property investors, need to be worried about falling values, especially in residential markets, especially in commercial property markets? Yes, and do I, I absolutely believe that um, we still have further corrections to come in, uh, in capital values. However, the rate of decline is slowing. It's also very, um, it's very localized. In fact, the MSCI IPD data uh, for the seven months to the end of July was positive capital growth for industrial logistics and residential, and then negative uh, the, 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 the biggest negative was, was offices, particularly out-of-town offices, minus 14%. So the fact is, unfortunately, the answer is not as simple as a yes or no. Um, what I can tell you is that equity markets swing between fear and greed. Mm -hmm. and, they, and when they're fearful, they will overreact. And, with the, and if you, again, back to the, my presentation, which is on the website, where we, we chart going back 30 years, the movement in discounts, and what happens is when markets get, when equity markets are displaying discounts of around 40%, you get a very rapid correction because suddenly when values, capital values stop falling, and we would argue that for industrial, residential, that's the case now, uh, not all residential, by the way, um, I'm thinking about it in a, in a pan-European context, actually the market quickly says, well, a stock standing at a 40 discount is way too, is way too wide. So... The answer is yes, there's still further negative numbers to come. Is it all in the price in the equity market? I think in many cases it is. And I think that's why it's very interesting. That's why I'm you know, a happy holder of shares in TR property. Uh, just one thing on the residential thing. If I'm a, a small time investor and I have a buy to let property, what, what should I be thinking? Buy to let in the UK is difficult because the government are do not want to impose um, rent restrictions. And they're right to do that, because in every other market, what happens when you restrict rents? Developers stop building, or they stop building for the rental market. Why would you build when you know you can only rent it and the rent is then gonna be fixed? Yeah, so this is the problem for Germany and for Sweden. No one's building new space, so you get this situation where everyone who's in the flat is paying not enough, and there's a, whole, and there's a long queue down the street. So the UK, you have a, an open market, but the way the government are trying to deal with, quite rightly, a lot of um, poor quality landlords, 
uh, is to in increase the amount of uh, regulation um, uh, onto you. So you will find that the difference between, as a buy-to-let uh, landlord, your gross to net, so what your tenant is paying you, but what you're actually getting in your pocket, because you can't set it off against tax, um, there is you know, a lot more um, uh, uh, certifications required around gas, electric, health and safety, damp, all the rest of it, um, which is, by the way, quite appropriate. Um, you're you're going to make less money. Now, at the moment, you're being bailed out because rents are continuing uh, to, to, to rise because there's a fundamental shortage. So if you are happy to live with this lower yield because you're a very long-term investor, um, uh, then that's absolutely fine. However, if you've got a floating rate mortgage, chances are you are moving pretty well soon into a, uh, particularly in, in the southern part of the UK where you know, yields are you know, sub 5%, um, or net yields are sub 4%, um, you'll be cash flow negative. You'll probably give up being a landlord then, and you'll just the tenant will leave and you'll put the building on the market and, and sell it. Is that good news for the more professional players in the private rental market? Yeah. We've got I, a handful of listed ones. We, we, we do, and I think there's a realisation that you and I as a, 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 as a, as a tenant, we'd, like, we'd much prefer a professional landlord. Mm -hmm. We'd much rather have L and G rather than Mr Smith, who we don't know what Mr Smith's personal circumstances are, um, and he suddenly decides to, to kick, kick, kick us out. Um, uh, at the end of our, our lease, whereas at least with the institution, you know, and you also, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll give you all sorts of, of commitments. So um, the, 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 the purpose built buy to let market, um, PRS market, is, it should be growing and it should be encouraged to grow. Um, the fact of the matter is, the, there are institutions competing for land um, and yields do remain very low. So it's not an area that we've been able to invest in. Well, I think that covers everything. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Rupert.